the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Some Pharisees came to test Jesus. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked Jesus about, again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And Jesus took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. As Lutherans, we understand that Jesus comes to us through Scripture in two different ways. First through the law, and then through the Gospel. And it is in both of those ways, law and Gospel, that we have the real, the fullness of God revealed to us, God coming to us. As people of the resurrection, we don't disregard the law. We acknowledge that the law is one way of receiving God's revelation to us. And we embrace the gospel as God's living good news for us, made known to us in Jesus. So in our gospel reading for today, we have some contrast. Here, we have the contrast between law and gospel. We have a contrast between marriage and divorce. We have the contrast between adults and children. Both of these, all three of these sets of contrasts are important to us for showing us who God is and how we are called to live as God's people. The Pharisees come to Jesus and try to trick him. So, Jesus, what does the law say about this? You know, they want to see, is Jesus a man of the law? Does he know his scriptures? And Jesus turns it right back to them. Well, what do you say that Moses says about this? And they answer. And then Jesus replied, because of the hardness of of your heart, God gave this law to you. You see, the hardness of the heart has been the reason for all of our sinfulness and our need for the law. Our hearts are hard towards others. Our hearts are hard toward our Father in heaven. Our hearts are hard to the least and the lowly and the needy to the poor, the forsaken, to the children. Our hearts are hard. And so as Moses goes up the mountain to be in the presence of the Lord, the Lord God, after 40 days, Moses lived in this mountain. The Lord God comes to Moses and writes the law. The purpose of the law was to give the community of God's people, to give the Hebrews some guidance, some direction some boundaries. For having raised teenagers and children, as many of you have, we all know that teenagers function better when there are boundaries. We function better when there are boundaries. 
We like to know just how far can I go before I get in trouble. And we all know that with boundaries set, we're more likely to push against them to see if we can make them move a little bit. You know? How far? How many times do I have to hit that line before it gets extended? This is the same thing that was happening to the Hebrews. In the 40 days that Moses was on the mountain, they forgot who they were. They didn't realize what the Lord God had done through Moses. They didn't remember the promise and being relieved, released from slavery. And so, as folks do, they go back to their old ways. Moses comes down the mountain and sees the golden calf. The people have turned from worshiping the Lord God and now worship this golden calf. They needed God in their midst. They needed something to look at that said, this is who we worship. Moses was very upset, as you can imagine, through the tablets. They break into a trillion pieces. God sends Moses back up the mountain after his rant against the people and then gives that law once more. You see, the law for the people is to set those boundaries, to say, this is how you live in community. This is what it looks like to be my people. No longer do you have to wonder. No longer do you have to worry. These, this law is what it means to be mine. And this law is given to you as grace, as gift, not to constrain you as much as to protect you, to keep you as my people, to give to you the boundaries that we all need. And so Jesus says to his disciples, because of the hardness of your hearts, God gave to you this commandment. God gave to you this commandment. When we enter into marriage, we enter into marriage with, with hearts in our eyes. Every time I do some premarital counseling with someone, you know, I, I ask them, okay, I see your love today, but what's your love going to look like five years down the road? Well, they can't even imagine that. So then I'll say to them, well, what does your love look like? When there's dirty socks and dirty underwear and the toilet paper is fixed the wrong way and, and the, the, we don't come home on time and the dinner gets cold, you know, what's your love going to look like? They can't even go there because they are so smitten with each, with each other. They just see one another with love in their eyes and they say, oh, we'll get through everything, Pastor. We can get through everything because we love each other. And so it is in a conversation that really probably is better saved for about five years down the road that I have with them that says, you know, love is not an emotion. Love is an action. And how we love one another is through our actions. The emotion is going to be here today and gone tomorrow. There are going to be days when we might not even like each other very much. <coughs> But love is lived through action towards one another. And sometimes, as we know, those marriages that God binds together unravel. That is the reality of brokenness in our lives. You see, God created us to be in relationship with one another. God created us to be in communion with each other. That is why God made so that each would have the companion, the helper, not to subject one below the other, but so that each benefits from the relationship, so that each benefits from the sharing of love with each other, that each has the helper, the helpmate in one another. That was God's intention, that all would live in harmony, and that we would walk through the garden loving each other, caring each other in all fidelity and integrity and honesty and purity. 
But we know what happened. That was broken. Sin enters into the world. And it is through the hardness of the heart, through the sin that enters into the world, that marriages can unravel. Whether that's through an affair, through just falling out of love, through abuse, through violence, through the temptations of the world, through just not wanting to be married anymore. Brokenness enters into the world and our marriages fall apart. You see, you have two choices when you're facing that decision. Stay married, put it back together again, or divorce. Those are two important decision points. And when a couple comes to me and says, Pastor, our marriage is un unraveling, we're not even sure what to do next, my first question, and probably many hours later, we talk about, what do you want to do? Are you both committed to putting it back together, to reinventing your marriage? Because that's what you must do. The old marriage has died for whatever reason. And to stay married means that we reinvent that marriage and we put it back together in a new way. That's the first decision point. And if both parties can say, yes, I'm committed to this process of reinventing the marriage, then we know we can travel down this path. But if either one hesitates, is uncertain, or says no right out, then that takes us down a whole nother path that ultimately ends in divorce and the ending of that marriage relationship. Now Jesus goes on to say, and the sixth commandment goes on to tell us, thou shalt not commit adultery. Adultery is very um, restrictive, very um, narrowly defined here in our text. To any time um, outside of the marriage relationship, there is another. That would be committing adultery on either part. And so we have this description of what adultery is. It is the hardness of the heart towards another person that leads us into the brokenness of a marriage relationship. And so Jesus is saying to the people here, it's not so much about marriage or divorce or adultery. It's about how you live in relationship. Sin is prevalent in the world. And so divorce, yes, is a sin of God. And we ask for forgiveness. And we receive that forgiveness. So is adultery as we break that sixth commandment. But if we stay focused on just the marriage relationship between a man and a woman, we miss the rest of the story. Because really what God is talking about here, what Jesus is saying to us, is that yes, this is a model of a relationship, a man and a woman, but life is about relationships together. We can commit adultery. We can work against a dear friend. We can cause the lies and the hardships of others through our gossip, through our broken relationships, through the hurt feelings that we carry towards another person. Any time that our heart is hard towards another person, we are committing adultery towards that person. And so, to illustrate, the way that we are to approach and live life. Jesus once more brings a child into the mix, just as he did several weeks ago when we read that story, that account. And Jesus says, let the little children come to me, for we all must come to Jesus with our hearts softened, with our hearts softened, in the love of our Lord, with our hearts softened towards other people so that we can raise up the children. And here that means every one of us, for we are all children of God. 
And so with our hearts softened, we are able to raise up others, to reach out to the needy and the poor and the lost and the forsaken, to reach out to our brother or our sister sitting next to us in the pew who is in need, to support one another, to pray for each other, to fill in when there is a problem in one's life, to show up and be Christ to that person. It is by the grace of God and by God's Holy Spirit that our hearts are softened at all. And so we come to worship to be reminded that as we live our lives as God's people, we live as people with hearts that are open, with hearts full of love. And we reach out to all, extending God's love to all and to everyone. For all are children of God and all are beckoned to God's presence and to be in God's love. We may fail from time to time and know that our sin is forgiven and that each time we fail and our hearts become hard, we come in the presence of the Lord to seek forgiveness, to hear the absolution of our sins, to taste and to eat the bread and wine of Holy Communion, to touch the water that reminds us that we are God's, and to see and to claim God's love for us in all of its fullness. God loves us always. Thanks be to God.